Soft wood was never supposed to last. That's the rule we're taught. Pine rots, spruce twists, fur collapses under time, water and insects. And yet the northern world was built on it. Ships that crossed violent seas, halls that stood through centuries of storms, bridges that carried generations, not reinforced concrete, not steel, soft wood. Somehow hardened, somehow altered, almost fossilized, and the method that made it possible was so effective that later observers swore the timber had turned to stone. They weren't wrong. They just didn't understand how it was done. This wasn't magic. It was process, slow, ruthless, climate-driven, and it worked so well that parts of it quietly survived into the 20th century, even brushing up against World War II-era construction logic before industrial speed buried it for good. Let's break it down. The transformation began before the axe ever touched the tree. Northern builders understood something most modern lumberyards ignore completely. When you cut a tree matters as much as how you use it. Trees were harvested deep into winter, after the ground froze hard and the sap retreated into the roots. At that point the trunk was starved of sugars, starches and moisture. In other words, it was already hostile territory for fungi and insects. Freezing temperatures did something else too. They forced remaining moisture out of the cell walls, tightening the internal structure of the wood. This was nature's version of freeze-drying. The fibres shrank, compacted and hardened before the log was even shaped. Soft wood started its life already tougher than anything cut in spring or summer. This isn't ancient superstition. It's physics and biology, and honestly, it's still applicable today. Wood cut in winter or stored through cold, dry conditions loses moisture gradually instead of trapping it. Even modern lumber benefits from this if you let it rest outdoors through cold seasons instead of, you know, rushing it into sealed environments. Water was not the enemy, and, well, that misunderstanding changed everything. Here's where modern logic really breaks down. After cutting, northern builders often submerged logs in cold rivers, lakes or bogs, months, sometimes years. To us, that sounds like deliberate destruction. In reality, it was chemical surgery. Water immersion stripped the wood of sugars and proteins that decay organisms rely on. At the same time, minerals from the surrounding water slowly migrated into the wood structure. In iron-rich environments, tannins reacted with those minerals and permanently altered the chemistry of the timber. Density increased. Colour darkened. Flexibility decreased while hardness rose. This is how bogwood forms, and while full bog preservation takes centuries, even partial immersion dramatically improves durability. The wood becomes less edible, less absorbent, and far more stable. For modern builders, the lesson is simple. Posts or beams intended for ground contact benefit enormously from controlled soaking, followed by slow drying. You're not rotting the wood. You're starving the rot before it ever begins. Drying was treated as a weapon, not a convenience. Once removed from water, the timber was not rushed. 
ever. Drying happened slowly, often under cover, but fully exposed to moving air. Years passed. Moisture left gradually, allowing cell walls to collapse inward instead of cracking outward. Density increased. Internal stress decreased. Compare that to modern kiln drying, where water is forced out rapidly, tearing microfractures through the structure. Kiln-dried softwood looks finished. It feels dry, but internally it's already compromised. Air drying takes patience. Stack boards with spacers, protect them from rain, let wind do the work. This single step dramatically changes how softwood performs decades down the line. Northern builders understood that strength locked in slowly lasts longer. One of the most misunderstood parts of the northern method was controlled charring. Beams, planks and posts were lightly burned on the surface. Not scorched, not destroyed just enough to seal pores, kill surface fungi, and create a carbonized shell. That carbon layer resists insects, moisture, and microbial growth. Meanwhile, the structural core remains intact. The result is wood armored on the outside and strong on the inside. This technique survived in parts of Scandinavia and Japan because it works. Full stop. You can still do this today. A controlled flame. Even coverage. Brush off loose char. Then protect it properly. Fence posts, cladding and outdoor structures last dramatically longer this way, especially in wet or cold environments. After charring came saturation, pine tar, resin blends, boiled linseed oil. These weren't coatings, they were treatments, applied warm, repeatedly, and allowed to penetrate deep into the hardened fibres. Unlike modern sealants, these substances didn't trap moisture inside the wood. They repelled water while allowing vapour to escape. They stayed flexible in freezing temperatures. They darkened and hardened the surface over time instead of peeling or cracking. You can still replicate this, you know. Just warm the oil or tar, apply it to warm wood, and then repeat over time. The transformation is slow but unmistakable. The wood becomes heavier, tougher and more resistant with every pass. Here's the part modern construction often ignores completely. Northern builders didn't rely on treatment alone. They designed structures so water never lingered. Roofs were steep, beams were lifted off the ground, airflow was constant, and joints avoided moisture traps. Wood treated this way doesn't need perfection. It just needs the chance to dry. As long as it can breathe between wet cycles, it survives, sometimes indefinitely. Modern builders, well, they can adopt this instantly. Elevate posts. Avoid sealed joints. Prioritize drainage over coatings. The goal isn't to make wood waterproof. It's to make it dry quickly. The method wasn't lost because it failed, but because patients died. This entire process demanded time, space, and long-term thinking. Industrialization replaced all of that with speed. Softwood became disposable because the system demanded turnover. Chemical shortcuts replaced climate, fire and waiting. By the time World War II pushed construction into mass production, 
the northern method was already considered obsolete. Not because it didn't work, but because it couldn't be rushed. For survivalists, homesteaders, and serious history buffs, this matters. It's proof that durable infrastructure doesn't require industrial supply chains. It requires understanding materials at their most fundamental level. Softwood didn't turn into stone by accident. It was engineered slowly, relentlessly, intentionally. If this breakdown changed how you see old timber and ancient builders, support History HQ by subscribing, sharing this with fellow historians, and keeping serious, research-driven storytelling alive.